Good evening and welcome once again to Insight Live. And as usual, we have very interesting topics. And tonight we're discussing modern day slavery. And believe it or not, there's 167 countries around the world where slavery still exists. And if you put together child soldiers, indentured laborers, forced domestic workers, sex trafficking, et cetera, et cetera, you will probably come to more or less 46 million slaves in the world today. So a warm welcome from me, Melanie. And yes, Tuesday night, we're excited to bring you uh, Becky Murray, who is the author of uh, Embrace the Journey. She has been working in Pakistan with uh, families that have been working in the brick factories. And from very, very early uh, ages, these kids have been made to work. And so you've got whole families, including all the children enslaved uh, and having a life of working in these brick factories in, the Pakist in Pakistan with actually no way out. And uh, so we want to, uh, you know, obviously enlighten ourselves as, as believers. We want to understand what is happening in the world. We want to be able to pray and to give into these, um, you know, into, into these, these works that actually relieve and actually petition on behalf of uh, these people who are in modern day slavery. So Kurt, we're yeah. very excited to have Becky Murray yeah. uh, joining us. And yeah, well, I'm excited that she's doing something about it because you know, not many people are doing because yeah. I, I, I was uh, reading a report, I think on Al Jazeera News, and it was a 25 minute well, kind of report you know, on the condition of, of slavery or indentured slavery in, in Pakistan. And some, I mean, it's several million people, including whole families. I mean, there's kids four and five years old working in these brick factories, and they're working something like 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm. And what happens is, say for example, I need a job and my mother's in a hospital and, and I have a big bill to pay. And then I'll go to one of these brick factories and um, maybe the owner will give me, say, I wanna work, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm strong, but I need $2,000 right now. Mm. And they'll give it to me, I'll sign a contract, and of course I can't read or write, so I don't know, I don't know about the interest rates they're gonna charge me, et cetera. Then I get a job there, and basically I will be there until I die. Yeah. My children will inherit my debt, and my children's children will also inherit the debt. And, well, the interest you know, the fashion, and yeah. he just had nothing but good to say about it, but the rea reality, is something different. And, yeah, he's lying and saying, yeah. you know, this is a family, you know, we look after each other and it's good for them, you know, to start early because then they've got a skill. I mean, five years old is not <laughs> starting at a brick factory to give you a skill. I mean, that's... Well, what happens is uh, one guy on the video was saying, look, we have to produce a thousand bricks a day. So that's hard to do for on your own. For one family, you're talking about? For, no, just one for one person. person. Oh, okay. But you're gonna have to, say for example, you know, we have two, I have two children and a wife, and I'm sick or something, I'm gonna have to bring you in oh, to help. Yeah. And so it's, it's really, yeah. really hard, but you know, in Isaiah it says that the sovereign, the spirit of the Lord is on us, okay? To set the captives free, mm. but it's not always easy mm. to set people free, you have to get involved in politics, you mm. face death threats or death, torture. Yeah. It's just not easy to go into Pakistan when the whole justice system is against you. Mm. Just want to uh, tell uh, viewers who have just joined us, if you missed the introduction, we are talking tonight on Insight Live on modern day slavery. And we have a, a very special guest, uh, Becky Murray, who's written a book and we're going to be interviewing her a little later. Kurt, you have yeah. prepared a few things for us. Well, let, let's meet, um, let's not interview Becky right now because we have two of her videos that kind of introduce you to her. And you'll see that she started out in Africa and then she was, I think, in Pakistan for just for a few days and her, and her life changed. That's the title of the book, Embrace the Journey. I mean, she'll go places and then bam, God speaks to her, her whole life has changed, other people's lives. So what do you do when you're, you know, you're just following God and then suddenly you're transported like <laughs> Philip into a place you never expected? I never thought I'd end up marrying a girl in Africa, for example, living in Spain. I mean, God really messes up our world for the good sometimes. So we might as well just like embrace the journey 
and hang on, but this first video is just an introduction to who Becky Murray is and her organization. In 2006, One by One founder Becky Murray came across a situation that would forever change the course of not just hers, but many people's lives. Whilst volunteering as a missionary in Sierra Leone, Becky met a young girl named Felicity and noticed she had no shoes. After buying some shoes for her, Felicity wrongly thought that Becky must have done this in return for sexual favours. This was a moment that would stick with Becky forever and ultimately cause her to create safe spaces that vulnerable children like Felicity would be able to call home. In 2012, the first fruits of One by One came into being in the form of King's Children's Home in Bumala B, Kenya. 200 children currently call King's their home, and although costing £150,000 to build, the entire project was paid for up front, in cash, with no debt or mortgage. Alongside the children's home, the One by One Schools Outreach Team in Bumala B reaches out to approximately 10,000 children every week across 18 schools. In the three years since its birth, the Dignity Project has reached almost 10,000 girls in communities at high risk of human trafficking. With both practical and educational tools, the Dignity Project will be empowering girls in new partner locations including India, Brazil, South Africa, Pakistan and Sierra Leone. In the wake of the 25-year civil war, the Hope Sri Lanka Project continues to regularly feed widows and their children every day. As part of the project, Supported career opportunities are currently being developed to help those who have lost so much experience hope once again. In 2018, the first bricks of King's Children's Home Pakistan were laid, designed with the goal of rescuing vulnerable children out of slavery. King's Pakistan will open its doors in 2019. Though starting as an encounter with one little girl, One by One has now taken more than 300 unique volunteers on missions trips, reaching almost every continent of the world. And through your generous giving, we have sent over £1.2 million directly to the mission field. Together, we can reach the rest, One by One. Isn't it amazing how God speaks to us? I mean, if it wasn't for that one girl, you know, that Becky had an experience with in Sierra Leone, none of this would be happening. Even George Mueller, Melanie, it was during a pandemic, actually, a cholera pandemic that God spoke to him through a person and he started founding his, his, his orphanages. So it's amazing how God, sometimes he doesn't speak audibly, but he'll mm. put a person or, or a situation in us. And that's certainly my experience and I'm sure mm. your experience as well. And, but let's go to the second video, because remember it said that the Kings was gonna open in, in Pakistan and uh, let's see, it, it has opened in Pakistan, and let's take a look at what's happening now. Well, hi everyone, and welcome to Pakistan. We are here at the opening of our second King's Children's Home. And we're so excited that 39 children this week left brick factories and joined a Christian children's home. Last year we came to do a Dignity Project here and after being taken to the brick factories and seeing children as young as three and four years old in bonded labour, making bricks for 14 hours a day, not getting any education, no hope for the future, seeing them paying off a debt that was never even theirs to begin with. It's been quite um, sobering to be here on one of the brick factories in Pakistan. Um, many of you have seen these places, heard about them, read about them. Here we are watching children literally work before our very eyes. It's bonded labor, it's slavery, it's injustice. We knew that we had to do something to change this. One of the stories we encountered was a little girl called Mary. 
she's got juvenile arthritis in all her arms and legs after having to work plowing the ground with her feet to make the clay. So much need here, so much desperation, but there's hope. So although this is the beginning of King's Children's Home Pakistan, we know that this is going to be a work that keeps us here for a long time. There's so much to do, so we just want to ask you to join with us today and keep praying for Pakistan, keep giving to Pakistan and keep supporting what God is doing in this incredible nation. Wow, I mean, with that incredible introduction, I think we should go to Betty, Becky right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just the, just the emotions. I mean, how can one person go from you know, from 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 Africa to Kenya to mm. to uh, Sri Lanka, et cetera, et cetera? It's amazing. So let's go over to Becky right now. Hello, Becky. <laughs> Hi, Kurt and Melanie. How are you doing? Hi, yeah. great. Well, welcome. We welcome you on behalf of our Revelation TV viewers. And uh, we're, we're just so excited to, uh, you know, speak to you personally. We've just seen these two videos, uh, absolutely heart-wrenching stories. And especially as a mother, I can't even believe, you know, just how, tor you know, what torment those mothers go through, not being able to feed their children, seeing their children suffer so much. So welcome uh, to Insight Live, uh, Becky. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. So I'm really curious. I mean, you're young compared to me, okay? <laughs> Stop saying that. <laughs> and you, you look young and, and you've accomplished all of these things. And I, and I know it started out with a dream of being a missionary, and, but just take us through your, your journey. You know, you talk about embracing the journey. And by the way, if anyone wants to buy her book, and I would recommend it, I've read some of it and it's fantastic. And it's called Embrace the Journey. And you can buy it, okay? You can buy it on onebyone.net. That's her website. And then money goes to charity. But of course, you can get it at Amazon and all of the bookstores that you're used to. So it's Embrace the Journey. But but, but the money does not go to the charity if you buy it through Amazon. So you want to do one by one dot net. That's where you want to buy yeah, the Amazon's book. Amazon is getting a lot of money. <laughs> During the pandemic, they've gone up like 100 million. So anyway, so go definitely go one and we'll, by one. And we'll one. tell you again. We'll tell yeah, you again. So yeah. don't worry. One by one dot net. So anyway, embrace the journey. How have you embraced the journey uh, throughout your life until now? <laughs> Let's start, well, let's start with the trigger. Let's start with the trigger, Becky. <laughs> so I was brought up in a beautiful Christian family. Uh, my mum and dad passionately loved Jesus. In fact, my dad would regularly be found crying into his Bible. He passionately loved Jesus Christ. And so growing up in that fertile soil, you couldn't help. It was contagious to be around. Um, and so I fell in love with Christ at a young age. Um, and apparently my mum tells me that when I was four years old, I always used to say with absolute boldness, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. <laughs> and my mum would laugh because there's no missionaries in our family. It's We don't know anybody else who was doing that. And so she would just be like, yeah, of course, baby. Um, but I would say with absolute surety as a four and five year old, that I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. Well, sure enough, I got into my teen years and um, I had my own desires and plans. So I'd come up with this great conclusion. I was going to study law. There was something about injustice that was like a red flag for me. Mm. And um, I honestly believe, you know, when it talks about God creating and molding us in our mother's wombs, I strongly believe that that's 
far more than just talking about our physical flesh and bones. I believe his plans and his destiny and his heartbeat are right there, molded into our lives as he's creating us. And so I believe as a child, God had put something there about injustice. And so as a teenager, I thought I would fight injustice using the law. It was also convenient that being a lawyer would come with a nice, healthy wage packet. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, I loved God, but I wanted this lovely, comfortable, easy life. And God had other ideas. Um, and so I was a teenager and just longing to travel, see the world. Uh, but coming from a strict Christian family, the only way I was able to travel the world was to go with my local church. Um, so I signed up for a missions trip, literally with the heart of, I just want to go and see the world. But it was on that exact missions trip that God spoke to me. And as clear as you and I talking now, God spoke to me and they said that I'd run a children's home. Well, I honestly, I came home from that trip. And because I knew that I knew that I knew that God had spoke, it was so clear. It wasn't audible, but it was very clear. And um, I came home and started telling everybody, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to run a children's home. And then the questions came, well, where are you going to run a children's home? When are you going to run a children's home? And I'm like, I've not got that far yet, <laughs> but it's going to happen. It's going to happen really soon because God said it. So it's going to happen tomorrow or at least next month or at least this year. Well, 13 years later, I finally um, opened my first ever children's home, which is in Kenya. Um, but in that 13 years, God began to take me on this incredible journey of just falling in love with Jesus. When you begin to fall in love with him, it becomes easier to say yes. Even when the yes is challenging, it becomes easier to say yes, because in comparison to him, nothing is worth withholding from him. So my life is for him anyway. It's all for him. It's all about him. He's, he's everything to me. And um, so he took me on this beautiful journey of just falling in love with Jesus. Um, but it was on one such, again, short-term missions trip. So I'm a big believer in short-term missions trips. So we take people all the time on the field with us now. Uh, because, again, it was on a second short-term missions trip that it was a, a trigger moment for me when I met a little girl who changed my life. She was called Felicity, a little street girl, uh, only nine years old. And she simply had no shoes, so took her to the marketplace and bought her a little pink pair of flip-flops that cost about 50 pence. It wasn't some huge act of generosity. It was just such a small, insignificant moment, or so I thought. Hmm. And uh, that evening, she came back to my hotel. She was wearing her new flip-flops, all excited because she's never owned shoes before. And she said, Becky, should I wait in your hotel room? I said, no, honey, we're just about to do this big gospel campaign. Come with us. Come come see this Jesus that I keep talking about. And she said, yes, but shouldn't I wait in your hotel room? Now, if she'd have asked my husband or any of the guys on the team, I would have known what she was asking. But here was a nine-year-old girl wow. asking a woman in her 20s if she should stay in her bedroom. And I remember thinking at the time she couldn't possibly be asking me what I think she is. But sure enough, she thought I'd spent 50 pence on her so that I could have her body. Now, a moment like that just did something extremely deep inside me because Felicity in that moment, she personalized the mission's call. You see, the needs of all the world are so great. We don't know where to begin. But this one little girl in front of me, well, I can love her. I can stop for her. And so she became the very mandate of God of I've got to give my life to this. This is not a negotiable thing anymore. I've got to give my entire life to this because no child should think that their body is worth 50 pence. Wow. And she changed my life. Wow. So let's, what a, what a powerful story. Um, I, that's what I, I would say that yeah. was like you were arrested by the Holy oh. Spirit. I just, I'm, I, I've heard this story and I'm tearing up already again because it's just so, 
unbelievable that a child would actually be, be thinking like that. When you think of children, they need to be protected, they need to be loved, they need to be nurtured and educated and fed well, you know, but your experience is just completely opposite and it's just, it's so heart-wrenching. So, so let's make a big shift right now because it's so tempting to talk about the work in Kenya or the work somewhere else because you have so much going, you go, going on, but let's specifically go to Pakistan. So what was the trigger moment? Why Pakistan? So, funnily enough, years ago, I had actually got a prophetic word about Pakistan, but I thought it was for somebody else. And I remember writing it down. I gave him a letter um, all about going into Pakistan. And then fast forward years later, we're running what's known as the Dignity Project, which is an initiative that helps girls at risk of human trafficking. Again, that started in Kenya, but began to spread all around the world. And um, it was because of the Dignity Project, we were invited to go into Pakistan. Now, the Dignity Project is very practical, helping girls with reusable sanitary products that they can stay in school and lots of training all around human trafficking. But the beautiful part of it is we sum up that nobody can put a price on your life because the highest price was paid through Jesus Christ for you. And so we were invited into Pakistan, a nation that's completely closed to evangelism. But because the Dignity Project is so practical, it's almost like they tolerate the gospel. Mm. So we were able to go in and reach 1,100 girls with this project. But it was on that trip we heard for the very first time about brick factories. Now, I'd never heard about them before until this moment. And we went in, they, it was our final day of this four day trip and they took us into brick factories. And I remember meeting all these people who were trapped in slavery. Now I deal a lot with human trafficking and it's all covered up, it's all hidden because everybody knows it's wrong. But here was a, a slavery that was so blatant. They allowed us to walk into the brick factory meeting all these people trapped in slavery. And it wasn't hidden, it wasn't covered up, it was completely blatant. And it it almost took me back, I, you know, when you just gasp, because I couldn't believe that in this day and age, in 2021, how can we still be talking about slavery? This was something that William Wilberforce was tackling generations ago. And yet here we are right now, still dealing with the same old issues. And it just, again melanie arrested my heart just mm. like meeting little felicity yet again meeting all these families and all these children mm. trapped in slavery arrested my heart mm. and it was a case of this is not an option we have got to do something mm. you know sometimes the holy spirit presents us with situations and it demands a response and this was one of those moments for us where it demanded a response. We couldn't sit back and say, oh, well, isn't that terrible? But, well, we're doing what we're doing in Kenya, so somebody else will have to deal yeah. with it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and you know full well, I need to do something but, here. But how do you get, the, look, these all these children and families, they're, they're under armed guard. It's like they're in prison. That's what they were saying in the video I was watching. And how do you get them out? How do you extract them? How do you get the children out of this indentured slavery? Well, we work firstly with um, nationals on the ground. So a lot of the time, our big job is raising up people on the ground. We're passionate about empowering people. It can't just be about us. It's It's got to be about raising up the army, God's bride, as it were. And so we work with nationals on the ground who can go in much more subtly than me. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 I wear all the, all the gear, but my little white face gives me away quite a lot in the nations I work in. And your accent. And, and my face doesn't, and my accent certainly does. <laughs> Um, but we go in and we we talk with the families, we meet the families, we hear their stories, we know them, they know them well, we work with these people. And so we started having families reaching out to us for desperate help for their kids because there's no way out, naturally speaking. These children are raised to make bricks for 14 hours a day. 
And so when they're an adult, they've never had an education. They can't even write their own name. And so getting them out of slavery into a home where they're away from the brickmasters, where they can have a full-time education and then go on to real employment rather than ex mm. being exploited. That's wow. brilliant. That's brilliant. One of the questions that, you know, I want to ask, and I'm sure our viewers would want to ask is, it's one thing having the prompt of the Holy Spirit and having a vision of what you want to do. But how do you even start getting finances to make this stuff happen? Mm -hmm. So do you have any miraculous stories mm -hmm. or tr drudgery stories? <laughs> do you know, it's, it's been a beautiful journey with that, where every time there's been a need, we've stepped out and never had the money, ever. So I remember the, ver the very first children's home, there was no charity, you know, one by one had, had just started. It had taken me literally a couple of years to raise maybe two grand. And I'm dropped with this bill of 150,000 pounds. Now, fast forward a decade, I wish my bills were only for 150, mm. but back then 150 grand may as well have been a million. Mm. It was just outrageous. I just didn't have it. And in the same year that we had to raise all the funds for the children's home, I gave birth to my own little boy. And we spent that entire year in hospital because he was so ill. Uh, oh. He had a rare genetic disorder, was in and out of major surgeries. We spent a lot of that year in oh. intensive care uh, with our little boy on a ventilator. But, you know, God brought in every penny. We had checks through the post. We had little faithful ladies in my local church pass me the £10 note and say, put that towards your project, honey. And it was amazing how from the small, tiny faithful gifts up to the huge, generous gifts, how God just brought that in literally blew me away. And I think I learned very early on at that point that, you know what? he's far more passionate about this than I can ever be. Mm. To me, this is my baby. I love our projects with One by One, but actually it's his and I'm just a steward. Mm. And so it's taken steps of faith. We never have the money before ever, um, but each time it's a step of faith. So even today, today, I've been emailing with our guy in Pakistan um, because there's so many kids. We had a, a murder in one of the brick factories a few weeks ago where a three-year-old girl was raped and murdered. Oh, three-year-old. No. Oh, no. Raped and murdered, and her body was just dumped in the office of the brick factory. Oh. And so, yet again, it was another, we've got to do something here. And so overnight, we decided to double our Sunday school work. So as well as running the children's home, we go into the brick factories every week with Bible teaching. And so we doubled our Sunday school overnight. Um, but even today we're inquiring, okay, what can we do to extend the home to take in more girls so that they're not at risk of being raped and murdered because no one should be at risk of that ever. Um, but even now we don't have the money for that, but I'm like, okay, well, we never have the money before we start. But we have a faithful God who is more than capable. Yeah. Well, I think that selling some books uh, on onebyone.net, <laughs> maybe our viewers are really interested in your story and would like to buy your book. It is Embrace, Embrace the Journey by Becky Murray. This is her story. And you can get it on onebyone.net. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also get it on Amazon, but none of the money uh, from Amazon will go to Becky's uh, projects. So you will need to order this book on onebyone.net. So uh, this is Embrace the Journey. This is Becky's story. And there are many more details that you will find in the book that will be absolutely inspiring and heart-wrenching probably at the same time. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask something, Becky, you know, for our viewers, really, how do you hear God? It's beautiful, actually. Um, so he spoke to me in different ways through the years. So like I said, for Kenya, he spoke to me as a young girl on the mission field. It was, it, it wasn't audible, but it was so clear. And he spoke it straight to my heart. I knew without a shadow of a doubt, it was him. You know, when you just know that you know, it was yeah. one of those moments. 
But then through the years, actually, how he's spoken has been different. So for Kenya, he told me before, you know, 13 years ago, he told me uh, about a children's home. And then the year before, he told me, now's the time, look for land. Um, but then for Pakistan, it was different. So Pakistan was going and seeing the need. And a good friend of mine is called Pastor Bill Wilson from Metro New York. And he always says, um, you know, the need is the call. If you see a need, well, that's the call of God right there. <laughs> and I, I, as I've grown in my faith with Christ, he's spoken in different ways. So sometimes it's been that, that voice within that's so clear. Other times it's been seeing a need and it demanding a reaction. You know, love God, love your neighbor. How can you love your neighbor in this situation when you're finding out a three-year-old's been raped and killed? It demands a response. Mm. Other times it's reading God's word and suddenly the Holy Spirit elevates a certain scripture. So for us, a key scripture in our organization is actually from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter one and verse 17 says, learn to do good. You know, if that's not what our journey is about, falling in love with Jesus and just learning how to do good in this world, be in his hands and feet in this world, but learn to do good. Seek justice help the oppressed, defend the cause of the orphans and fight for the rights of the widows. And for me, that's been a key scripture that the Holy Spirit's talked through in terms of this is what I'm meant to do with my life. And so although it looks like we're doing lots of different things through one by one with widows and orphans and now working with kids who were trapped in slavery, but it's all to do with that one scripture that the Holy Spirit just spoke upon you know sometimes it's wow. like he breathes into it and it just comes alive in your heart mm. yeah so so tell us a story about maybe a family some children that your organization is working with in pakistan right now just so we can kind of understand the whole situation what they're up against sure. in the country something that illustrates yeah. the difficulties and the challenges yeah but before before that yeah. uh, you know one of the things that uh, we want to make clear to our, our, our viewers is that you try, try to keep the families together because I think that would be one of the things that people would be kind of concerned about. Okay, so why are the kids going to a home and what, when do the parents see? So maybe perhaps in yeah. your answer to Kurt, you can just kind of explain that dynamic as well. Okay, sure. So to answer Kurt first, um, I remember one of the first families I met, I, I asked them, well, why are you here? What, what started your journey into being in bonded labor? And he said 13 years ago, he was um, married to his wife and she fell pregnant with their first child and everything was exciting and wonderful uh, until the labor came and there were complications with the labor. Well, he was a poor man and he couldn't afford medical care. And he knew if he went to a bank, he would probably be declined alone because he was just a poor guy. Plus he needed the money like now to pay for mm. surgery. And so he did the only thing he knew to do. He went to a brickmaster and asked for a loan. And um, the brickmaster gave him a loan. I think it was $150 at the time. And it paid for the cesarean section. Everything was fine. The surgery went well. The baby was healthy. The mum was fine. So great, right? Except 13 years later, I'm looking at this man and wife and their now teenage son. And they've gone on to have another three children since. And this whole family of four kids oh. are now trapped in bonded labor. Oh, and terrible. so they're saying, well, $150 that you've been paying off for 13 years. I mean, surely you've paid it off by now, right? And he said, oh, no, now we, we are several thousands of dollars because the interest rate is so high, we can never afford to pay it off. And so their children will inherit this debt, this debt, it will get passed to them when their parents pass. And so I met other children who were paying off their grandparents' debt. And so it's not just yourself that's trapped in bonded labor, it's your whole family lineage from generation to generation that are now going to be slaves. The masters literally own the people's documentation, your, your identity cards, it's all owned by the master. You are literally no longer your own. And so these masters can choose to send you all around different brick kilns or carpet factories.
factories or fields mm. wherever around Pakistan that they earn because many of them earn multiple sites all around the nation and so you can be sent several miles away from your family even it's heartbreaking and such an injustice and so I remember speaking with these families thinking okay well let's pay off their debt let's you know I can do it just give him page or something and try and raise the money to at least see this one family set free. And so I spoke to the locals about, okay, well, how do I about go about paying off their debt? It's only a few grand, which to a Westerner is nothing. Why can't I just set this family free today? And they, they almost laughed at, oh, you Western girl. And it was a case of, if you're a blood relative, you can pay off that debt at the actual rate. But an outsider coming in to redeem them would be charged double, triple, quadruple, whatever to outprice you. Oh. Because actually to the master, that slave is worth far more than the debt that they owe. And the masters know this full well, which is why the interest rate is so extortionate. And so I remember coming home thinking, God, what on earth do we do with this? How do we make an impact here? How can we see these precious people set free? And again, um, we felt in our hearts to build a home um, to help the children. So the Brickmasters gave permission for certain kids. Now, it was the kids that were sick, the kids that couldn't make a lot of bricks for a living because they had juvenile arthritis because from the age of zero, from the age of one, two, whenever they can start walking, they're made even with their feet to start molding the clay and then with their hands as they get older to form it into bricks. So from a tiny toddler age, they're made to work, which by the time they reach eight, nine years of age, they've already started with arthritis in their hands, uh, such as little Mary you saw in the video. She was one such child absolutely in agony constantly because of juvenile arthritis as a result of the bonded labor. And so if we can get these kids out into a home away from the masters, many of our kids have now got medical treatment and are actually doing really well. So we can't afford for the brick masters to see these kids starting to grow and get healthy and strong because they would demand them back. So what we do, because we are passionate about keeping families together, is we encourage parent contact to come through. The parents can come and visit their child at any time. There's no restrictions with that. Obviously, the kids are in school through the day, but in evenings or weekends, the parents can come because we want to keep that strong bond. Because the whole goal of this is that these children will have a full education and then gain employment. That's Mary that you're seeing right now, the little girl who had the juvenile arthritis. Mm. Um, she's now doing phenomenally well, really strong, really healthy. Praise Jesus. Mm. Uh, but the plan is these kids will have full education, gain true employment, and then through that employment, not only can they pay off their family's debt, but because they've got employment, they can sustain their families out of slavery. You see, the problem is if you've only ever made bricks your whole life and someone suddenly pays your debt off, you can walk out of the factory, great, freedom, right? Except you've never had an education. So you can't go on and get employment. Neither can you afford to buy a house. How are you going to eat? And so for many slaves, the answer is not just, okay, let's wipe it off and set them out. They actually need something ongoing. So even now, not only have we done the children's home for the kids, where we, we started with 39, we now have over 50 kids that we've managed to get out of slavery. Wow. But we've also started sewing lessons in the factories so that teenage girls and women and whoever wants to access it can start having sewing lessons in the hope that just like we've done in Sri Lanka with the widows, we can start people with their micro businesses right there in Pakistan. So again, they can start chipping away at that debt and gaining real employment. Well, that's amazing. Oh, that is amazing. I just want to remind our viewers, uh, for you, if you are watching this amazing program uh, with Becky, Becky Murray uh, on slavery and especially uh, in uh, Pakistan with the Brick, Brick Masters. Uh, please do write in, let us know what you're thinking about this and perhaps you've got some questions for Becky. I know this is a very troubling subject and I know many of you are like probably going to guess is hardly 
possible to believe that something like this would actually be happening in modern day and especially you know the impossibility of these families to be actually, actually able to escape this or to get out of it so please uh, feel free to write in ask becky a question um, any of the details um, and we will let you know uh, what she has to say about that so that's good um kurt any other questions that you might have? I've got tons of questions, well, but okay. Take, so, take a turn. <laughs> so, so Becky, you know, when you are a missionary with this, these kind of things going on, how does that affect your family life with your husband? Uh, you know, uh, you know, brothers, sisters, cousins, whoever else is in your family. How, how is that affecting your family and what people would call normal life? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think life is normal when you're a missionary, that's for sure. Um, and I think I think sometimes we get it right and sometimes we ethically fail at this. So I'm not even going to pretend we've got it all worked out. Um, but a big thing for me or a big honour for me has been actually to bring my own little boy out to, to different places with me. We've not dared take him to Pakistan just because um, it's high, high risk out there. So even when we're there, we have to take different routes to the children's home each day because we're often followed. It's it's much more, it's a different place compared to Kenya. Um, but our little boy has come with us several times out to Kenya and met all his Kenyan brothers and sisters who have watched him grow up through photos over the years. Uh, but he's gone out there and learned a little bit of Swahili and learned to cook chapatis with the girls and all different <laughs> things. Um, and he's come with us out to, to South Africa and all different types of places with the Dignity Project. And it's lovely watching him because he's learning, oh, okay, this is what Christianity is. It's not just a set of beliefs, but actually it's a lifestyle, hence embrace the journey because every single one of us whether we believe we're called to missions or whether we're called to a normal life as some people would say every single one of us are called to love god with all our hearts and love our neighbor as ourselves. and how better to do that to, to throw our little boy out into the mission field and be like okay god love your neighbor <laughs> Um, and so, like I say, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it ethically wrong, but we're learning on our own journey with that. Um, and it's the yeah. fun of learning, right? Yeah, that's right. right. Well, one of our viewers has written in and said, uh, Uriah Welfare Organization Lahore are trying to do what you are trying to do and could help you. Oh, in Lahore, you Pakistan. Sorry? Is it Lahore, Pakistan? Yes, yeah, Lahore. Okay. Lahore. Okay. Uh, trying to uh, do the, and uh, what are, they're trying to do what you're doing and could help you help them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please get in touch. That's what uh, What's they, the name they, of the they say to you. It says Uriah, U R I A H, welfare organization. So Becky, maybe um, you know you'll be in touch with them. It looks like. Uh, they want to help you help them or something. <laughs> Try to do and could help you help them. <laughs> okay. <Whatever. laughs> that makes so sense. that's that's them. Uh, so that's them, Becky. And then we have here Phillips um, just written in and said, a wonderful program, Melanie and Kurt. Uh, please, could you ask Becky how the COVID pandemic is affecting Pakistan? Blessings. And that's Clarissa. Becky, would you like to answer that? Uh, that is about yeah. how the uh, you know COVID pandemic is affecting Pakistan. Absolutely. So yes, uh, up until recently, COVID had taken less impact on those nations. But over the last few months, it's almost like they've just caught up. And so um, for people in the UK, like myself, nations like Kenya and Pakistan are both on the red list at the moment, um, which again comes back to why we're strongly believing in raising up other people. Yeah. And so thankfully, because we raise up people on the ground, uh, so Pakistani nationals, Kenyan nationals, to go and run the children's homes, run the schools, run the Sunday school projects, it can't all be about us, because if that's the case, it's, it's all going to fall flat. But it's, when we spend our lives raising up other people to go and do it, keep doing it, every single one of us can stop for the one and if we raise up an army of people with that mentality who love God passionately and love these kids passionately, 
then the projects themselves can still continue even in the midst of a global pandemic. Wow. So even in the middle of COVID, we were able to start Sunday School in the brick factories and not just start it, but actually extend it. So for the last year, we've been working in 24 brick factories, reaching about 400 kids a week with Bible teaching. Wow. And since we heard of the three-year-old who was raped and killed, we've actually doubled that. So we're now in 50 brick factories, <laughs> reaching almost a thousand, over 700, but we're aiming towards a thousand children per week wow. being reached with Bible teaching and fun and games through Sunday school. So we can't allow COVID to stop it, even though for me personally, I've been grounded because of COVID. Oh gosh, really? Oh dear. <laughs> uh, we have another, a couple of emails here, a couple of questions for you, Becky. Um, this one is, uh, Kurt and Melanie, why do we not know about these appalling happenings? Um, and there's another Good one. Uh, yeah, uh, there's another one actually along the same line. So I could mention my question is why do the Pakistan government allow these brickmasters to uh, extort these families with obscene interest rates? Why don't the government outlaw this? God bless. And that's from Mark Becky. So those two questions from our viewers. Yeah, great questions. And um, even for myself, until I was there. I knew nothing of the brick factories because it's not something you see on your news regularly. Um, and sadly, it's, it, it's not spoken about enough. Hence, it's amazing what you guys are doing to shine a spotlight on this exact need because we need more people to do that exact thing. Um, but to answer Mark, um, we, we, you know, I think sometimes media will try to downplay stuff. And so only a couple of weeks ago, uh, Imran Khan, which is the prime minister of Pakistan, was in the news. And when he was asked about rape and, and, and things like that happening amongst women, his response was, well, they need to cover up because not all men can resist the temptation. Now, wow. how sickening is that? Wow. Because all of a sudden it shifts the blame onto the woman. Yeah. She's raped because of how she's dressed. Now I've been out there. I've I've seen how we how how they dress, head to toe covered. I remember being out there. The heat. I'm English, and the heat was intense for this British girl. And I'm there in a whole headscarf covered from head to foot. My husband and, and the other guys on the trip were allowed to wear shorts, but there I am, headscarf, the lot fully covered. Wow. And so to hear the prime minister say the reason rape happens is because of how women dress yeah. just infuriated yeah. me. Moments like that is just so unjust. Not it's, taking it's responsibility, fun. yeah. So uh, the next one says we, uh, so this is actually from the, the, the group Uriah that I mentioned before. And they said, we are making a documentary about this community through Uriah Welfare Organization to raise awareness of these families to get them uh, self-sustainable and out of slavery. So that's good. So maybe you that's might nice. end up um, uh, connecting with them somehow. Uh, one of our viewers is absolutely horrified and shocked. Annette writes in and she says, hi, Melanie and Kurt, I am speechless. This is all in capitals. Is there anything politically and legally that can be done to restore their freedom? Credit unions should be invited in to help. God bless. And that's from Annette. What about that um, option with kind of a credit union type of thing? I know that Pakistan probably, you know, operates a completely different way. Yeah, in terms of, and, and even going back to what Mark asked about as well, in terms of, you know, politically what can be done? Well, the reality is in Pakistan, child labor is illegal. And so that's what makes this so mind blowing of, well, wait a minute, one of your laws says that this is illegal and yet it's still going on all the time. What What's that about? And so I even asked, well, what happens with like local politicians or the police? Why don't they step in? And I was told by the locals that, well, they're often bought out. Many times the politicians are the ones owning these brick factories oh, wow. and the profit is high. Now, I can't say that for everybody and I wouldn't say that for everybody. I'd get myself shot. Um, but the truth is there's a lot of injustice and there's a lot that goes 
kind of under the radar because the profits to be made from brick factories are so high. Occasionally they do have police who are passionate about this, um, but the locals informed me those people often um, go missing, shall we say. Wow. Wow. Well, Becky, thanks so much. I, I just really think that people should get hold of her book because it's just a it's just a really well written book. I, I I read some of it, you know, and I was just I was just like gripped immediately, and embrace, embrace the journey. And how can we get hold of your book again in case some people just tuned in now? Yeah, so viewers can go to onebyone.net and on the star page they'll find the book available to purchase and all the profits from the book go straight back into the mission's work. And so not only are they buying a book that will hopefully inspire and challenge them, but also the money raised from that will actually help us to rescue more kids around the world too. So it's a double blessing. That is a double um, blessing. Any viewers who want to get in touch, <laughs> If they go to the website, oneby1.net, they can sponsor a child out in Pakistan. They can buy a book. They can, they can get in touch with us. They can contact us to know how to pray, sign up for the newsletter, all that kind of stuff, all there on the website, oneby1.net. Great. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Well, uh, Becky, we want to just thank you so much for taking time to be on Insight Live, Revelation Television. Our viewers are very grateful for you uh, sharing your story and amazed at how God has uh, spoken to you and uh, provided for you in every way so that you can make such an impact uh, you know, in these very desperate situations. So Becky, thank you so much. Give love to your husband and to your son, of course. And we bless you, we bless your work. We bless the sale of this book so that there'll be finances freeing you up to do what God has called you to do. Th thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Bye, Absolute Becky. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Hope to Bye. see you God in bless. Spain sometime. God Bye. bless you. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Do we have time for uh, one more? Yeah. Okay, so Brian, uh, you've just written in. I'm sorry if this is a question for Becky, but, uh, oh, it is actually. Hello, Becky, yours is an incredible story, which brings a lot of hope uh, from the parents not being able to pay off the original debt, resulting in the entrapment of the children, working slavery in the brick factory. Uh, the brick factory. How do the parents earn any money at all? Uh, to even attempt to pay off the interest and at the same time to feed and clothe their children. Do they just uh, in, uh, keep increasing the original debt with the brick factory owners and therefore also the interest? Thank you, Brian. Brian, yes, that is exactly what's happening. It's and, an impossible catch-22 yeah. situation. And I heard some testimonies where the, uh, the brick master actually took them to the hospital to sell their kidneys and didn't even give them the money. It, it just goes on. It's, it's horrible. Absolutely. Uh, demonic but this is what we do on Insight Live and Revelation TV we shine the spotlight I like how Vicky said that on things that are sometimes really really uncomfortable this is very unsettling just for me that to, to see this going on but we're shining the spotlight that you know perhaps you will be involved in this setting the captives free so we want to thank you so much for being with us and of course you can uh, you can forward this to people go onto the website find insight live for tonight and share it so this is a very important message thanks for being with us thanks for participating with us and please be praying for becky and for this ministry remember one by one.net <laughs> And it's been great to be with you, and we will see you next week as usual. God bless you. Goodbye. <laughs>